they're also sort of cases of what I think of as faux Machiavellianism. Uh, kind of faux intellectuals engaging in tough talk uh, to show that they have really lost their innocence, which is the sort of you know, intellectual uh, equivalent of, of, of losing your virginity, you know, showing you're not, you're not really innocent about the world. Machiavelli, of course, likes to play that game. And it suggests that the world is divided between the weak and the strong, between the realists who th see things the way they are and the idealists who require the comfort uh, of moral illusions. Uh, yes, Machiavelli sometimes seems to corroborate this point of view. Does he not say that armed prophets always win, the unarmed prophets lose? Did he not write that he wrote, did he not say that he wrote to reveal the effectual truth of things and, and not just what people have imagined the case to be? Yet it seems inconceivable that Machiavelli wrote an entire book simply to prove the obvious. That is to say that the strong will always crush the weak and that politics is left to those who leave their scruples uh, at the door. The question is, was Machiavellian was Machiavelli really that kind of Machiavellian? Was Machiavelli a Machiavellian? Let's, let's see. What kind of government did Machiavelli think best? As he indicates at the beginning of The Prince, there are two kinds of regimes. There are principalities and republics. But each of these regimes, he says, is based on certain contrasting dispositions, or what he calls humors, humors, humori, humors. In every society, he writes, this is chapter 9 of The Prince, in every society, two diverse humors are found from which this arises: that the people desire neither to be commanded nor oppressed by the great, and the great desire to command and oppress the people. These are the two great political, psychological dispositions. The popular desire not to be oppressed and the disposition of what he calls the great uh, to command and oppress. Machiavelli uses these two psychological and even in some ways quasi-medical terms, humors, to designate two classes of people on which every society is based. His theory of the humors in chapter 9 seems in some ways to be rep reminiscent of Plato's account of the three classes of the soul, or the three parts of the soul, with one vivid exception. Each class of the city, he says, is bound or determined by a humor, but neither humor is anchored in reason or rationality. Every state is divided into two classes expressing these two qualities, these two psychological qualities. The grandee, the rich and powerful who wish to dominate, and the populo, the common people who wish merely to be left alone, who wish neither to, be ru to rule nor be ruled. Now one might expect that the author of a book entitled The Prince would favor the great, would favor the grandee, th those who desire to rule. Are these are, are not these aristocratic goals of honor and glory precisely what Machiavelli seems to be advocating? Yet in many ways Machiavelli proceeds to deprecate the virtues of the nobility, perhaps to our surprise. The ends of the people, the ends, the purposes of the people is more decent than that of the great since the great want to oppress and the people want not to be oppressed, he says. His advice is that the prince should seek to build his power base on the people rather than on the nobles. Because of their ambition for power, the nobles will always be a threat to the prince. And in an interesting reversal of the Platonic and Aristotelian conception of politics, it is the nobles here who are said to be the more fickle and unpredictable, while the people are more constant and reliable. Remember, in the Platonic and Aristotelian view of politics, the democracy, the rule of the people, the demos, 
was always criticized for it being fickle and, and un unstable and, and subject to whim and passion and so on. Here Machiavelli tells us it is the great who are subject to this kind of inconstancy and the people are more reliable. The worst, that a, the worst he writes, that a prince can accept from, expect from a hostile people is to be abandoned by them. But from the great, when they are hostile, he must fear not only being abandoned, but also that they may move against him. The, pop, the, the grandee are more uh, dangerous and fickle. So the main business of government consists in knowing how to control the elites, because they are always a potential source of conflict and ambition. The prince must know how to chasten the ambition, uh, to humble the pride, as it were, of the great and powerful. And this, we will see, uh, as early as Wednesday, becomes a major theme in the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes. Humbling or chastening the, the pride of the few. The rule of the prince or sovereign requires the ability to control the ambition uh, and to do so through selective policies of executions, of public accusations, and political trials. Remember the example uh, that we read uh, at the end of class on Friday, I believe from chapter 7, the, the example of Cesare Borgia and Romero di Orco, and how his execution, his bloody execution, left the people, Machiavelli says, stupefied and satisfied. Here is a perfect example uh, of how to control the ambitions uh, of the nobles and to win the people uh, to your side. So Machiavelli's prince, while, while not exactly a democrat, uh, recognizes the essential decency of the people and the need to keep their faith. And by decency, he seems to mean their absence of ambition, the absence of the desire to dominate and control. But this kind of decency is not the same <coughs> as goodness, for there is also a tendency on the part of the people to descend into what Machiavelli calls idleness or license. The desire not to oppress others may be decent, but at the same time the people have to be taught or educated how to defend their liberty. 1,500 years of Christianity, he says, have left people weak, have left the people weak, without their capacities to exercise political responsibility and the resources to defend themselves from attack. So just as princes must know how to control the ambitions of the multitude, uh, how to control the ambitions of the nobles, excuse me, they, the princes must know how to strengthen the desires of the common people. Some readers of the prince, even some very astute readers of the prince, have thought that Machiavelli's work is really, or Machiavelli's prince is really a kind of democrat in disguise, and that the prince is intended precisely to alert the people to the dangers of a, usur of a usurpatory prince. This is, for example, what the great 17th century political philosopher Spinoza believed about Machiavelli. In his book called the political, simply called The Political Treatise, Spinoza wrote, Machiavelli wished to show how, how careful a people should be before entrusting its welfare to a single prince. I am led, Spinoza continues, to this opinion concerning that most far-seeing man because it is known that he was favorable to liberty. That's Spinoza on, on Machiavelli. <coughs> because it was he was favorable to liberty, and that the book, he says, is kind of a satire on princely rule. Or if you don't believe Spinoza, if you don't believe his authority is sufficient, consider someone who you'll be reading in a couple of weeks, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, from The Social Contract. Machiavelli was an honorable man and a good citizen, Rousseau says, an honorable man and a good citizen who, being attached to the House of Medici, was forced during the oppression of his homeland to disguise his love of freedom. So that the prince was written 
in a way that disguised the real teaching of the book, which is the, the love of, of freedom and, and the pre presumably the, the freedom of the people, something of the type that Rousseau himself spoke about. <coughs> maybe these comments go too far. I mean, maybe they are exaggerations, and I, I think to some degree they are. But it's revealing that both of these very serious readers of Machiavelli took him to be an apostle of freedom. Spinoza taking him, taking his book to be a warning to the people about the dangers of princely rule. Rousseau believing that he had deliberately disguised his love of freedom because he had to appeal to the tyrannical <coughs> nature of the, of the Medici family. In either case, they regard him as surreptitiously taking the side of the people against the nobles. <coughs> In any case, whatever one makes of those examples, uh, Machiavelli seems to be challenging important aspects of the classical conceptions that we've been talking about up to this point. In the classical republic, for the ancient republic of Plato and Aristotle, this repu this, these republics were ruled by nobilities, uh, gentlemen possessed of wealth and leisure, who are therefore capable of forming sound political judgment, who will dominate. While in Machiavelli's state, it is the people who are going to be the dominant social and political power. Machiavelli wants to redirect power to some degree away from the nobles and toward the people. One wants to know why. Why does he want to do that? In the first place, he judges the people to be more reliable, as he tells us, than the great. Once the people have been taught to value their liberty, have learned to oppose encroachments on their freedom, to be fierce and vigilant watchdogs rather than humble and subservient underlings, they will serve as 